book of Ruth, chapter number three. The book of Ruth, chapter number three. And I wanted to add two jokes to the mix that Brother Drew already gave. Uh, the first is a lady took out a home improvement loan for Valentine's Day. Home improvement loan. And on Valentine's Day, gave the money to her husband and said, get out. And uh, number two was this one. Uh, uh, because it's the season, a Polish uh, guy I heard uh, went ice fishing for the first time, had all the equipment, went ice fishing, started as ice auger up and just got ready to make his hole and he heard a voice, just heard a voice that said this, there are no fish under the ice. Well, he was puzzled by that, he's looking around, so he just decides that it was a something of his imagination and goes to make that hole again and the voice comes again louder there are no fish under the ice and he says who said that the answer comes back the rink manager the rink manager <laughs> ruth chapter number three the scripture gives us so many incredible stories of love isaac and rebecca abraham and sarah joseph and mary uh, even in the New Testament, Aquila and Priscilla. My wife and I talked about them a little bit this week. And today's passage is no different. This story has a lot of layers to it. The story of Ruth is a story of love, uh, how uh, Ruth and her husband were married. It's a story of death, how her husband passed away. It's a story of mourning. And it's a story of deep abiding family ties and family love, how that Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, made a pact, an agreement with one another, beautiful, beautiful agreement. And I see a lot of times, uh, even this time of the year, on different uh, uh, Valentine's Day things, you'll see this quote, you know, where thou goest, I will go, uh, thy people will be my people. That wasn't really... Uh, a statement for Valentine's Day, but rather it was a love agreement, a deep abiding family love between Naomi and Ruth. But then in the book of Ruth, we also see a beautiful story of renewed love. And all of this is found in the book of Ruth. And like anything else in the Bible, the story runs deeper than just what would be on the surface. This is a real story, and it is uh, very well documented. History attests to the fact that Ruth and her husband, Boaz, were a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. They're part of the lineage of David, King David in the Bible. But it's a beautiful story that runs deeper than that because it is a beautiful story of redemption. And that word redemption is a big word that we use. And you say, well, what all does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ, with his own blood, bought us back to himself. And that really is the picture that underlies all of the story of the book of Ruth. So we're going to see in the book of Ruth, chapter number 3, we'll start in verse number 9. And I'd like to read through following. The Bible says this. Ruth chapter number 3 and verse number 9. And he said, Boaz is speaking, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And this is not language that's familiar with us. In 2021, we'll explain it a bit. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter. For thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. 
And now, my daughter, fear not, for I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And now it is true that I am thy near kinsman. Howbeit, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. Uh, this is not some kind of illicit, uh, romantic tryst in the middle of the night. It is the time of the harvest. They are on a threshing floor in a barn. There are other people around. And she has come in to make a request of him. And he requests of her several things. We'll talk about that. And uh, uh, their, their feet are touching uh, because they're opposed to one another, but nothing more than that, I assure you. And maybe we'll talk about that in a moment, just after we pray. I'm going to ask if you'll bow your heads. We'll get ready to pray together. I'm going to ask if Brother Josh Martinez will take us to prayer, and then we'll pick up the story as soon as we're done praying. So here's where we pick up the story. Ruth has come alone, and she has come a long way from the country of Moab, where she is from. She married a man who was a Hebrew. Na Naomi's son was Ruth's husband. The Bible does not tell us they had any children, but in the order of events, her father-in-law, Elimelech dies. So does her husband and her brother-in-law, her husband's brother. So that leaves three ladies as widows. You have uh, Ruth and you have a co-daughter-in-law and then you have the mom. And there's a little story there where the mom says, hey, um, I love you guys, but I want you to know that you're free to go. You don't owe me anything. Uh, I'm going to go back to my people where I came from, this, the town in the area of Bethlehem. Uh, that was, of course, in a different country. She said, I'm going to go, but you have no obligation to me. You don't have any obligation to stay here, take care of me. I'm going to go back to my people and the provision of my people. As a widow, I can go back and... Uh, there, there are some provisions in the law of my people where I'll get a little bit of sustenance and I'll be fine. Well, one of them decides to take off, but the other one decides that she's going to stay with Naomi. She's not bound by any legal obligation, but they are bound together by love. And that is the connector there. So they come back together and they come back into the city and uh, Naomi wants to change her name from uh, Naomi to Maraf, which is the word bitter. She says, hey, when I left here, I left full. I had my husband, I had my children. But since I left, everything's been taken away from me that's of value. And now when I come back, I'm coming back as a bitter woman. But... Sometimes, as is the case when you get into bitterness, you have more present than what you think. And really, it was Ruth that was going to be able to lift Naomi out of her bitterness. And it's something we ought to think about. Sometimes when we're bitter, we get in this doom and gloom, and the things of value around us, we don't even notice. So she comes back, and people say, whoa, who is this? And she says, oh, it's Naomi. But you don't, I don't want to be called Naomi anymore. Just call me bitter. So they find a place to live and they start establishing themselves 
And Ruth begins to go out. It was time of the harvest. She goes out to begin to scratch a little living for herself and for her mother-in-law. And as she's out in the fields, as the Lord would have it, she lands in the fields of a man named Boaz. Well, Boaz is in Bethlehem the most eligible bachelor. He's very rich. And uh, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about his good looks. But I want you to see something interesting. In verse number 10, and he said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, insomuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And there's an indication there. I could lay it out, but uh, Ruth is not ugly. She's not an ugly gal. And uh, the Bible never says that, uh, that uh, her intended person here, Boaz, is ugly either. He's a very desirable man, but very careful. She's come all the way from being a lost foreign girl in a doomed country to finding herself at the feet of a wealthy landowner whose name is Boaz. At his feet, she's about to find the help that she needs. She is looking for a redeemer. There has to be somebody who has the ability to restore to her all of the things that sin and death have taken away from her. Now, are you beginning to see the picture between us and Ruth? She finds herself at a point of need at the feet of her kinsman, Redeemer. We'll expand on that in just a moment. If Ruth had a favorite song, it would be this. I am redeemed by love divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. Now the passage we read has a lot to say about redemption. And if you enjoy the fact that you're saved, you can enjoy it. And if you're not saved, you definitely can see the picture of what salvation means to those of us who are saved. And you could also enjoy the possibility that all of this can be yours. What is required to receive redemption? I hope you'll see it in the passage. First of all, I want you to notice the proposal of Redemption, the proposal of redemption, the proposal that was made. Verse 13, tarry this night and it shall be in the morning. If he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, but if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of a kinsman to thee as the Lord liveth. He's making a promise. He's saying, I raise my hand and make a promise, solemn promise to the Lord as the Lord liveth. Lie down until morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. It was still dark in there. Nobody else could tell what was what. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Now the reason that he did this is he wanted to protect her. He didn't want anybody to think that she was being inappropriate. He did not want anybody to think that she was an illicit woman. He didn't want anyone to think or in any way tarnish her reputation. He did not do it for himself, but rather he is doing it as a protection to her. And when I read this, it made me think a lot about a man in the Bible named Joseph who had a great love for a lady named Mary. And it was discovered that Mary was with child and he would have had the ability to put her away privately, quietly. But he decided, you know, I am not going to have anybody think ill of Mary. And it's something very similar to that. It made me think of that. Also he said, bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. And when she held it, he measured 600 measures of barley. I mean, six measures, not 600. Oh my. And she'd have to be a, a, she'd have to be a cart to carry that much. Six measures of barley and laid it on her and she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said, Go, not empty, 
unto thy mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he had finished this thing. Notice the next two words, this day. Ruth went to Boaz and requested redemption. You know what Jesus says? Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus Christ has done everything that is necessary to save the soul of a lost sinner. Everything has been done, but it requires action on your part. It requires action on my part to come humbly before the Lord to ask. And I want you to listen to this. In true love, you can be open about your needs. I'll say it again. In true love, you can be open about what your needs are. You can communicate what are your needs. You can express those needs freely. Boaz didn't say, what? Why are you doing this? What do you want from me? What are you trying to get from me? And that certainly is the self-protective mode that many people live in. They can never be satisfied and they can never have their needs met because they're never willing to ask. Did you know in God's economy, he invites us to ask? Yes or no, does God love you? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. But what does he do? He invites you to ask. The deepest needs, oftentimes in a relationship that are never met, are not met because we don't know how to express what we genuinely need. And while we're on the matter of needs, I have to say this, that real love does not give us what we want. Real love will always give us what we need. Did you know that sometimes what you want is not really what you need? Some people say, Pastor, I don't understand it. I've been asking this and such of the Lord, and the Lord hasn't answered my prayer. We've got to go back to this love thing. Does God love you, yes or no? The answer is yes. And God divinely knows exactly what we need. If it's something that will make you happy, healthy, and holy, God is always willing to give it to you. Ruth is reassured Because she makes her request and some reassurances are given by Boaz. Very quickly, I'll go through them so that you see what they are. First of all, Boaz makes some promise to her. Boaz makes promises to her. You know, we live in a resource-rich church age but a commitment poor church age. We live in a resource rich church age, but we live in a commitment poor church age. We have Christians that at the age of seven or eight have made a lifetime commitment to their sports team. I mean, you say ever since I was a little boy, You know, the Red Wings, they're my team. Or, I hate to say this from the pulpit, I'm going to say the L word, or the Lions. The Lions, they're my team. And I mean, live or die, the most resilient, committed fans in the world have to be Lions fans. And we laugh a little bit about that. They could just transfer that same kind of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, they won't miss a game. Live or die. They'll watch. Oh, it was ugly. I had to close close my eyes in the second half. Well, that's very typical syndrome of the Lions fans. But you say, but you know, ah, maybe next year. 
But if the wind blows in the wrong direction, people don't come to church. And the point that I'm making is that there were some promises, some commitments that Boaz made. And his promise to her was this, that he would do whatever was necessary to see that she would be redeemed. I want you to see it. He said that he would do everything. He said, I, then will I do the part. Everything that needed to be done, he would take care of it down to the last detail. I want you to see the provision. Not only the promise that he reassured her with, but the provision. When Ruth left the threshing floor the next morning, she left not only with his promises, but she left with his provision. She is laden down with provision, approximately 88 pounds of barley on her back. Can you imagine her walking through the city? She doesn't know what is going to happen with this whole redemption and kinsman redeemer because she had some property and she had some inheritance that could come her way because of her husband. But the only way that that could happen is somebody had to step forward and say, I will redeem you. I will speak on your behalf. I will take you on as my responsibility. She could not do that for herself. But she knew this. That if Boaz was the one that was allowed legally to step in and do it, he had the means to do it. He would have to buy her inheritance. 88 pounds of barley on her back. Naomi asked her this, Who art thou, my daughter? You know what she was asking? If you look at the way it was phrased and what it meant in that day, she was asking this, are you the next Mrs. Boaz? Are you the next Mrs. Boaz? That's what she's asking. Ruth says, I don't know if I am or not, but I know this, he has the means to do it. She told her all that the man had done to her. And notice what the mother-in-law says when she understands the promise that is made and the provision that he gives her. It's the last phrase of this chapter. Read it with me out loud. For the man will not be in rest until he hath finished this thing this day. What is he saying? Listen, he's not going to dally. He is a man of action. And this man is as good as his word. What he said he will do, he will do today. He's not going to leave you hanging, Ruth. You will know today whether or not you are the next or the Mrs. Boaz. Reassured by the provision. And think of the promise that he made. I want you to think as a believer the promise the Lord has made to you. He said, I will never leave you. Did you know that's one thing we need is, as individuals? We need presence. He assures us of his provision. The Lord said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory, and glory by Christ Jesus. God has assured us his protection. He said, I will never leave thee. But notice that uh, Ruth is also assured by his persistence. Naomi tells Ruth to sit tight. This man will not be in rest he said I'm not going to keep you waiting waiting is the worst isn't it <laughs> so this is the proposal of redemption I want you to see some of the difficulties or obstacles or problems that they were confronted very quickly there was a requirement for a kinsman redeemer in order for Boaz to fulfill the role of the kinsman redeemer, the requirements were that there had to be a relationship. There had to be a relationship. The kinsman redeemer had to be a near relative of the person that was being redeemed. Boaz fulfilled that requirement. Number two is 
there had to be resources. This man had to be able to buy or purchase or exchange money or resources for the right to purchase this inheritance. The same passage teaches us that the kinsman redeemer had to have the funds to buy back the sold possession. Boaz had the means. Boaz had the relationship. But there had to be something else. There had to be a resolve on his part. And I want you to see that. Let's go to verse number one of chapter number four. Are you with me? I want you to see the resolve that Boaz has. And as we read this, I want you to understand that Boaz is doing everything properly. You know, so many folks, they, they, they want to enter into this matter of relationship, but they're not willing to do things in a proper way. There's some folks, they want their relationship of salvation, but they want to go things in a roundabout way. And did you know, according to the scripture, there's only one way of salvation. There are not ways of salvation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. You're not going to step over Jesus on your way to heaven. You're either going to bow your knee to him, or he will be your greatest obstacle, your stumbling block. That's what Paul called him. A stumbling stone. So let's go to chapter number four, verse number one. I want you to see the persistence on the part of this man, the resolve that he has. He has the required relationship. He is related to her and can buy this inheritance. But there's one person that stands between him and, and, and this inheritance. He has the resources, meaning that if he wants to, he's able to buy it. And he has the resolve to do it. Then went Boaz up to the gate. This is the next day. And sat him down there. And in the gate, he's going to see everybody that's coming out of the city. Why did he do this? Because he knows the man that he's talking about is likely going to be there. The elders of the city often would sit in the gate. So he is calling basically a meeting to resolve this matter. Then Boaz went up to the gate, sat down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by. Well, hey, good day there. Unto whom he said, ho, such an one. That's what he's saying. Hey, hello there. Turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And the idea here is that Boaz has some clout and he says, hey, I need to talk to you about something, but it's an important matter and we need to do it in the eye of and the witnesses around us. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit ye down here. And they sat down. What do we gain from that? Here's a man who's respected. He said, I need you to help me with this matter. Your testimony in front of the lost is so important. Are you a respectable person? When you speak, do people listen? Or is it blah, 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 blah. It's just this person spouting off. We just really don't want to hear it. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you. That when Boaz came to resolve his matter, his testimony mattered a lot. And can I say this about us this morning? Our testimony matters. Boaz was a faithful man. And people took notice. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. He said the matter at hand here is a legal matter. There's some property here. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. What is he doing? He's putting them on the spot. He's putting the pressure on him. Uh, not twisting his arm, but he's close to that. If thou wilt redeem it. He said, I don't want a dally on this matter. I want an answer. 
I want you to give me, in front of God and these witnesses, I want you to give me an answer. Do you have any intention on giving some relief to this lady Naomi? Are you going to pony the money up? Are you going to buy this inheritance? If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee. Notice this next beautiful phrase. And I am after thee. And he said, I'll redeem it. He said, I'll do it. I'll do it. But Boaz is very wise. Very wise. He didn't give him the whole package up front. Maybe Boaz would have been a good car salesman. I don't know. Then said Boaz, What day... Thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And this was the way that God had ordered it for the tribes of Israel. Because what would happen is, if they went out to war, and maybe one tribe went to war, and all of the men out of that tribe were slain in battle then really their inheritance would pass away and the original dividing of the land would be uneven and pretty soon you'd have a super tribe that owned all of the country. And the way the Lord designed it is that could not happen so that other people would uh, marry that individual. That was fine, but they had had to raise up children and those children then would be rewarded back that property so that the land of Israel would continue Uh, to uh, propagate with all of the tribes being represented. It's a very long matter that I don't have time to lay out. The point is this. The property comes with the babe. The property comes with the babe. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I mar mine own inheritance. Oh, just a minute. Now he's backpedaling. What had he said? I'll redeem it. But he said, I'm not going to mess up my life. I'm not going to mess up my own inheritance. Now this was the former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to conserve... For to confirm all things, the man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. This was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kingsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. Boaz was resolved to buy it. He didn't leave her waiting. He was a relative and he made it happen. Now, what happens upon redemption? Well, what happens is Ruth is elevated. Ruth is elevated. Who was Ruth? Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth the Moabitess. Verse number 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess. But that changed. That changed. Verse number 14. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and shall nourish and a nourisher of thine old age for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and lay it in her bosom and became a nurse unto it. And the woman, her neighbors, gave it a name saying, This is the son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. Ruth is elevated. She is no longer the Moabitess. And in the scripture, if you'll read, She is now compared to Leah, Rachel, the wives of Jacob. She is now part of the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that Boaz is exalted. 
While some folks elevate Ruth, the main focus of the rejoicing is this man, Boaz, who made it to happen. Boaz was the kinsman redeemer. The end of the story is this. Ruth's life changed. Ruth's life changed that day at the gate of Bethlehem. Why? Because she found a redeemer. I'm saying that the most beautiful thing that can happen to any man, woman, or child is that they, the day that they have an encounter with their redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the most beautiful love stories in the scripture. She had a new life. She got a new lease on life. She had a new family. And now Ruth could sing, I'm redeemed by love divine, glory, glory. Christ is mine. All to him I now resign, for I have been redeemed. Music